Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report with Yvette Walker, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Welcome and thank you for joining the Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV. I'm Yvette Walker, live, blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, serving a population of over 25 million. Get us crystal clear and on demand by downloading the free live streaming app on Google Play or the Apple App Store. As always, a huge shout out and Thanksgiving wishes to the team, Mitch, Bill, and Sean. I love you guys. And to our special advisory committee, Bill Morris, UCI School of Business, Jose and Camila Rubio, thank you so much. Today, I have the distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Mr. Jose Ulloa. Jose is best known as the Latino Cyber Guy. Having started his career at Latina Style Magazine in 1997, he created and presented a national scale seminar focused on educating business owners to make informed technology decisions in purchasing and application of technology. Jose quickly rose in the media ranks through his efforts in radio by developing and producing the only Spanish speaking technology show on a national broadcaster, W690 AM. Jose has been featured and aired live, including TV segments on number one morning variety shows, including Telemundos, De Todo Un Poco, Fox's Good Day LA, and Univision. He has made it his mission to educate consumers, especially in the Hispanic community, which has been recognized to drive spending in the U.S. reaching $1.84 trillion in 2020 and is projected to soon reach $2.6 trillion in purchasing power in the U.S., according to Bloomberg Venia. Jose's decades in media and broadcasting have allowed him to make an impact on buying trends while becoming a household name. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jose. Thank you, Ms. Walker. It's a pleasure to be here celebrating Thanksgiving this week. And as you know, all major conversations deep within families start at the kitchen table or at the dining room table. So I'm pleased to join you this day and I'm ready for the future. Beautiful. So let's buckle up and get ready for the future. But first, let's talk a little bit about your journey and what, you know, motivated you. What was it inside of you that inspired you to pursue this career in media? Well, like many of us, we always have a desire when we're kids to be something. And then when you go through life, things change. Uh, I was supposed to be a physical therapist, which was my goal back in the day at, at UCSB. But then one night, uh, my my roommate said, Hey, I need help at the radio station. And uh, would you help me, you know, help me that with the radio station to get my show on? I said, we have a radio station. You have a show. I didn't know that. <laughs> and then before I know it, that was like, like the lightning rod that changed my life. I want to do this. And uh, not just for the music and the fun entertainment, but it's a platform not only to express uh, the culture and the trend, but also to get insight. And I think from that, it began, uh, you know, my career in radio first at KISS FM. AM back in the day, uh, doing news, and then going to direct TV and going into the local cable scenes. And the fortunate thing that I've had the opportunity, and some people say is, look, I began with a lot of these technologies. So as things began to emerge, and as the internet uh, resolved itself, then I saw the greater need that 10, 15 years down the road in 1997, I said, our life is going to change. Yeah. And uh, so why not explain to people those changes? So it's not a culture shock. Uh, because when you're living in the present, you know, you don't have money, you don't think about these things, and you're just really trying to make it day to day. But there has to be individuals, we call it back in the day, uh, R&D, research and development, that uh, do these types of things and give you insight. Then it's up to you to make that decision. And that's one of the things that's sorely lacking today. And that's why I had the opportunity to be on, like I say, one of these shown for 15 years in the a morning news show, as well as Fox Good Day LA and all the other TV stations as I you know, began to move from not just selling the merchandise, because anybody can sell anything on TV, but really explaining what's the good and what's the bad and keep people born, informed as to, you know, what's going to be under that Christmas tree 12 months from now. And you have no clue what it does other than it's a drone. And you're saying, OK, what is that? <laughs> or it's a PlayStation or, right. you know, it's the first iPhone. And people were confused with the first iPhone. I had the opportunity to play with it. And so uh, I'm, I'm at that advantage that a lot of companies send me products and the rest. Well, it's history, as now most people are 
acclimated to the products that they have at this moment by their side. Beautiful. So you and I recently had the privilege of joining the LA Auto Show at the LA Convention Center. And so we're going to start a conversation with some of the things that we saw there. And also, of course, with the awards that the Hispanic Motor Press bestowed upon, you know, the attendees of the, of the show that day. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the technology that really kind of jumped out at you um, during uh, the day at uh, the LA Auto Show. Well, thank you, Ms. Walker. I, you know, we both had the pleasure of walking the floor and a man's perspective and woman's perspective are totally different when it comes to cars. But in reality, the baseline is a technology. And what we noticed at this Alley Auto Show this year was the predominance of EV vehicles. And that's because by the year 2035, 12 states have already signed a contract to legally get rid of gasoline powered vehicles or petroleum uh, because of greenhouse gases and things of that nature. So there's a rush, and I would call it a car rush, by all manufacturers to begin this process. And like I said, the government is behind this. And we're going to see some major changes. And as well as the most important changes that we saw in this transition is the battery. You know, where before you used to, you know, used to take four hours to eight hours to charge up a battery. It can go from 18 minutes to 30 minutes to charge up a battery. So we know that's been the sort of the hurdle everybody's been trying to jump, but that also creates problems that most people are not aware of. So that's the challenge that we have today is that technology is advancing rapidly. Batteries are getting smaller, but at the same time, um, as we move into these technologies, as I go back to R&D, nobody has thought of the consequences because as you know, most technologies in the last 25 years, we have been the guinea pigs or the, sort of the, the people who test it out. And as you know, they're always saying to you, what did you think? How do you feel? And uh, you're the, almost like the test rat. And so as we move in these 15 years to this EV electrical world that they're trying to create with smart homes, all connected, um, it's going to be a challenge. So we know the technology is there. So we know that it's capable of doing. But uh, we'll talk about the other things, aspects that nobody has a chance to do. But as for the car show, batteries, um, like I say, that have changed. And uh, mileage has changed, you know, from 100 to 300. But, you know, those are the things that uh, we have to talk about as because those are averages, you know, non-daily use. It's just, okay, how far can it go on a straight line? It can go 500 miles. But if you use it on a daily basis, how, you know, how can that uh, like say, affect your life? But, yeah, it's challenging, uh, this new technology, because uh, what are you going to do with uh, your car now as they move into this this uh this whole new range of electricity vehicles or electric vehicles in 15 years. Right. And so Hispanic Motor Press took it upon themselves to award several cars across several categories. Um, would you like to share some of those categories and some of the, the recipients of those awards from Hispanic Motor Press? So Hispanic Motor Press is an organization that started off with some racing individuals, guys that just love racing, mechanics breaking it down. You know, it's a hobby like anything else. But, you know, as people's cars started to advance uh, from working on them, because a lot of people used to work on their cars before. Now you don't work on it. You have to take it into the shop because of all the computerized gadgets that are on there. But that was the impetus of this organization to give those people questions and reliable trust, tr trusting answers that you can have. So what they do every year is they look and test out all the new cars that are coming out so that you have a baseline. So I'm not trying to recommend that you go out and buy this car. But if you have a chance, go see this car first or truck, you know, or EV, because then you have an idea of what the expectation of what should it be as compared to they're just selling you the mileage, you know, that it can go 500 miles, but they don't explain everything else in the vehicle. So that's what the Ricardo and various other people, uh, 25 judges have done this past year, tested them through male and female in that process. And so uh, they're giving you a baseline. So let's look at the best technology of the year. If you get a chance and you want to see all the gadgets that you know are integrated into a car that with technology, then General Motors Super Cruise. And, you know, just looking at it, you're going to love it just looking at it. But then when you get inside and see everything that they added to it, it'll take an hour for me to explain. But I want you to go out and check that car before you go start looking at other vehicles. So you have an idea of how everything is changing with technology. The city car of the year, as you know, most people are within a city uh, are uh, that uh, 
that they, you know, want to have a smaller car that's practical and uh, you can go back and forth. The Hyundai uh, Kona was awarded uh, the best city car. So just running errands back and forth, less than 25 miles a day, you're you're there. And then when it comes to a luxury vehicle, and uh, if you don't know what luxury is, you know, it's like that little chocolate they put on your pillow at night in one of these hotels or roses or petals or, you know, flowers and basket of fruit, you know, th- you know, it's just that little extra stuff. Well, if you want to know what luxury is and remind you of luxury, because, you know, everything now, even though they're big name brands, you know, sometimes they lose that panache in essence that uh, they're not as luxurious as you thought they were. But this luxury vehicle, the, the Jeep Grand Wagoneer, just sit in it. You know what I mean? I, I want, and that's what's great about the, the car show. You're not hounded by salespeople that are just wanting to make sure that you buy it right there and then or how much cash you have or your credit go through. But, you know, this, that's what's so fun about the, the, the Wagoneer, the Jeep Grand, which backs luxury vehicle of the year. Then when we talk about an EV car of the year, the Kia EV6, everything that we know about EV, EV electric cars now has changed. So that old EV car that you have, and I won't name the brands because I don't like to diss brands, but the old one that you have, well, that technology is gone, you know. And so we have a whole new technology that allows for, you know, longer, lo- longer um, longevity. I guess that's the word, longevity, so that you can use this car for a longer time. And has a, you know, some extra little pluses in there that we'll talk later on uh, about this. The SUV of the year is the Kia Telluride. And uh, it's one of those that I would go glamping in. You know, these are the vehicles that you just feel like you want to just sleep in it and live in it 24 hours a day as they do these vans and trucks that they're, they're gla- you know, glamping up with uh, for being out there. And the last one was the Chevrolet Silverado is the truck of the year. And, uh, you know, it, it, they look great. But uh, after all these judges have gone through them, it's a list of questions uh, that uh, they have. And based on that list of questions, male and female, they come down to these to these last six uh, awards. Uh, and then they do this every year uh, right before the Ali Auto Show. And you can see that at Hispanic Motor Press, the conference uh, live uh, or taped now. But uh, that's the opportunity you have. So if you have a chance, like I said, General Motors, Super Cruise, Hyundai Kona, Cheap Grand Wagoneer, the Kia V6, the Kia Telluride, and Chevrolet Silverado, use those as your baseline. Because then as you go to other cars, because it just caught your attention, then you're going to say, oh, well, it's what about this? It's missing that. Or, or when's the upgrade? Or how long does this battery last as compared to these cars? So, you know, as a, as a leap of faith, I want to thank uh, the Hispanic Motor Press. Uh, Ricardo is the president and CEO of the foundation. And they also give a scholarship away every year uh, to a young aspiring engineer, uh, whether it be male or female that wants to evolve themselves in the car industry and designing, whatever it might be. And this year's awards, Mr. Tomas, is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, Latino from uh, Northern California, that's putting things into cars that you can't imagine. In 15 years, it's going to happen. So that's it. It's it's fascinating to see that the, it, everything is fresh. There's a new generation of young kids and, you know, people that aspire to have something brand new and, and technology that, you know, helps save the planet. And so, Thanks to Hispanic Motor Press and all these cars. And I, if you remember those, and if you can remember those in your mind, Yvette, uh, the, you know, they were absolutely stunning just from a pretty point of view. But, you know, these have the technical research and development built in by this organization. Absolutely. And so when I was there, I was super impressed. And I felt very fortunate to see other EV vehicles, such as the Toyota Prius, you know, the new reimagined completely 100% new technology, top to bottom in the Prius, nothing on it is the same, which was very, very impressive. And then also to come across completely autonomous self driving vehicles that in some cases have more than 2 million miles of autonomous driving without, you know, uh, incidents or um, problems or any violations for the vehicle, right? So they're better drivers than we are. They don't fall asleep. They don't, uh, you know, they don't drink. They they don't get distracted. They don't text while they're driving. So it, it'll be an interesting to see it how is. this new technology is integrated, especially now that some of this technology is going to be um introduced into LA via Uber Eats as well as Lyft. So uh, everybody should stay posted on that really remarkable technology that's 
already here, basically. Yeah, and the only the only caveat is the fear factor for older generation. It's like trying to explain to your grandparents how to use the iPhone. With you know, they're like, "What is this? How can I talk to somebody around the world on a phone?" And they're still trying to figure out you know all the things that are on it. So for an older generation, having a driverless car is one of those things that it's a fear factor. But for a younger generation, they're excited about it, and particularly the handicapped people who are blind, people like I say who need to go to uh, doctors and things of that sort, where these vehicles can immediately go and take them. Uh, and so that's what I said. There's benefits to a lot of this technology, and uh, you know, there's also consequences that we'll talk down the road. Absolutely. And so of this technology, what was the most impressive to you as you walked the floor at the LA Convention Center? I think the the, the biggest hurdle I, for me was, was the battery life. Because ideally in the old model EV, you have to really plan your route. If you wanted to go cross country, you mean you literally had to find places where, you know, there was, where there's an electric uh, recharging station and then wait four hours up to eight hours, depending on what the voltage is at that pump station, um, and then move on. So it's not a seamless travel from Los Angeles to Florida because it what once would take, you know, two, two days and a half in driving the, in, a, in a gas vehicle now takes you four to five days in an EV back in the day. Well, 18 minutes. You know, that's the amount of time you spend in a gasoline station right now, you know, right. letting the car fill up and then going inside and trying to figure out what you're going to eat. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. And so, you know, um, one of the things that I noticed also along those lines in terms of the charging, you know, challenges and the barriers that we're looking at, you know, be it for, for long road trips or even the day-to-day -day, uh, trips. Um, actually, this would probably apply more to the day-to-day -day trips. And that is that I, I was very surprised and happy to see independent um, uh, solar providers for uh, stations to hook up and purchase alongside EV vehicles. So basically being able to create and bundle packages that include, you know, freestanding charging stations that are solar, uh, that use solar panels for the home, where, you know, ideally, uh, a new owner of an EV could you know, purchase their EV alongside this integrated infrastructure specifically for their their home and their yeah. automobile. Well, that's it. You know, right now there's one in four vehicles that are electric vehicles in the road. They expect that to be almost uh, seven to 10 in the 15 years. So that's going to be a strain because one, what's going to happen in gasoline stations as gasoline petroleum moves out of the of the avenue of using, it's not that it's going to go away, but it's no longer going to be the dominant fueling energy. So gasoline stations you know, or gas owners or people on those stations have to rethink their model in 15 years for that. But it also gives an opportunity for small business people and particularly people who have small businesses and busy locations where the energy flow is a business orientated. So it's 240 or above so that you can actually uh, go to these types of companies and say, I want to buy that pump and put it in my business so that it doesn't necessarily have to be the gas station anymore. The problem with home residential right now is that we know that it it absorbs too much power. And uh, like I said, that's going to be the fight between you either charge the car or you, you have air conditioning in a hot day. So that's why the homeowners at this point, the the infrastructure doesn't allow you for that opportunity. But if I was a small business and I was located in a busy corner or at this point start looking, you know, at mechanic shops or places where people usually congregate because we're going to need the same amount as gas stations we see on every corner. And then it's going to have to be double because the charge time, like I say, is going to be longer. And so, yeah, those are things that, uh, that I'm really excited about is that now there's an opportunity because uh, the government is as I say, already giving I mean, two, well, a trillion just in this whole subsidy market, which can subsidize um, uh, some of these purchases for you. So it's not an initial, okay, I got to, I got to put out $20,000 or I got to put out a hundred thousand dollars for four months. Well, we know the government has released billions of dollars and right now major corporations are using that money. And as we look at small businesses, particularly the Latino community, it's an opportunity to, to own these and, uh, and charge from. 
Absolutely. And so ideally with a charge of 300, obviously um, with the new laws that are coming down the pipeline and the number of EV vehicles that will be on the roads, we're going to need a lot of charging stations to keep up with the demand, right? I mean, if well, you yeah. give an estimate, you know, throw out an estimate, how many charging stations will we need, Jose? Well, they're saying four times the amount of gasoline stations we have. So look at every corner you ha- uh, in our neighborhood. Well, you, uh, you have, if particularly in, in, in highly impacted neighborhoods, you're looking at, you know, 100 versus 25 that are currently in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So because once again, the the infrastructure which is, is, is sorely uh, n- not being used correctly at this point or hasn't been upgraded, is going to be a challenge to do that because that we know in this last heat wave we had, uh, the governor of California was urging uh, most people uh, to not charge their EV and find another way to go to work, which is kind of a bummer. You know, I bought the car. A little bit, <laughs> right? Especially in California, when you think, you know, electricity, we have solar panels, we have the whole nine yards. So it'll be great to dive into what plans we have or we see for the development of infrastructure to keep up with the demand, which, as you say, is going to be four times the number of gasoline stations as we see them today. That's correct. And in the state of California, is uh, behind the eight ball right now because they're bold initiatives. Everybody wants to have a clean air and stop greenhouse gases. Nobody's against it, not even me, I'm a tech guy. But the challenge of our infrastructure right now, the electricity is forcing to, to begin the discussion of, okay, what are we gonna have uh, to, to mitigate these circumstances? Because right now our power grid recharges at night so that it can maintain the current uh, power that we have to for all these new gadgets that we were currently using. Because traditionally in the last 40 years, you know, 40 years ago, we didn't use this that much electricity. Right. Well, now think of all the gadgets you have powered in your house and televisions and things of that sort. And at night, the opportunity to, to like I say, to recharge was always the let it cool down the system. But when you have a system and particularly electrical wires that are get hot and very hot and they need to cool down while they don't cool down anymore because at night everybody's going to be charging their EVs. So that creates an issue that most people are not talking about. And I'm beginning to redress now as putting the electrical companies under the, you know, under the microscope and say, what can we do uh, in our existing infrastructure? And and a lot of these infrastructures that we're finally realizing are like say 60 or 70 years old, the parts are no longer available and uh, to upgrade them is substantial. So the government, this is where the, the federal is coming in and saying, okay, we're going to subsidize you to rebuild. But that rebuilding will take till 2040 or even 2050, maybe 2060, right. just to be on time to, to, for the current, for just the basic current demand, not the maximum. So, you know, time doesn't work from our side. I, and I think Congressman um, Tony Cardenas from, uh, uh, District 29 here in California, he's on the Energy Commission and, and and technology side, has made it a fact that these things have to be talked about and these things have to be slowed down because otherwise we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot, which puts us in a very rather unique position, you know, where you have to choose of power in your car or air conditioning or heating in the cold because the winter's coming and uh, charging. So, uh, it's great that these things could, these technology can get us away from greenhouse gases. But in reality, in real life, there's also challenges that we have to face in regards to how it affects our normal routine. Beautiful. And so on that note, we're going to head on to break and pick up where we left off, Jose. Thank you for that. And for those listening, I'm Yvette Walker on Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV, talking with Jose Ulloa, the Latino cyber guy, focusing on the LA Auto Show's unveiling of automobile technology, as well as the future of EV policy in our communities and what we can expect to see as it unfolds when we return. Thank you. 
It's summer, the sun is shining, and now's the time to make the most of your solar panels. Don't lose up to 50% of your solar panels' efficiency just because they're dirty. Get the most out of your solar panels and call my friends at Solar Panel Cleaning Specialists at 951-663-7502. That's 951-663-7502. Mention this ad and receive your discount. Offer expires December 31st. Hi, I'm San Bernardino County Sheriff Shannon Dykus. If you're looking to start an exciting career in law enforcement and make a difference in your community, we are hiring. Dispatchers, nurses, deputies, laterals, and many more. For a complete list of our jobs and more information, visit sheriffsjobs.com. City of Hope is driven to making a difference in the lives of people with cancer and diabetes. We accomplish this by conducting innovative research and providing outstanding care. If you or a loved one has received a cancer diagnosis, go to cityofhope.org to learn more about how our innovative approach could change your outcome. Every two seconds, someone needs a blood transfusion. Be on the giving side. Livestream Blood Bank supports patients in 80 Southern California hospitals. Call 1-800-TRY-GIVING for more information and to set an appointment. Cal State San Bernardino is home to the only School of Entrepreneurship in California. With globally ranked degree programs, you can start your journey today to become a successful entrepreneur. Learn more and connect at entre.csusb.edu. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Hi, Ray Lance from the Diamond Center in the Claremont Village here. For three generations in our family business, we've been helping our clients find the perfect gift, and this year we're doing something special. Shop with us between November 25th and December 17th, and if it's 83 degrees or more on Christmas Day, you get your money back. Come find your perfect gift this year at the Diamond Center in the Claremont Village or Lance, L-A-N-T-Z, DiamondCenter.com, and we'll all hope for a little heat this Christmas. Welcome back. For those listening, I'm Yvette Walker on Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM, and KMET TV, talking with Jose Ulloa, known in radio and television broadcasting as the Latino Cyber Guy, focusing on the LA Auto Show's unveiling of automobile technology, as well as the future of EV policy in our communities and what we can expect to see as it unfolds. Thank you again for being with us today, Jose. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited about the future because uh, you have to be an optimist. It, the world is not perfect. We just have to, like I said, continue the transition, but in a reasonable way that we don't sacrifice or cut off your arm uh, in the process to get what you need to do. So that's uh, that's one of my biggest issues. And we'll continue with this conversation. Absolutely. And so before the break, we spoke just about that. We were speaking about the advancement of EV technology, the infrastructure that it's going to require in order to really sustain, you know, the massive uh, need for those technologies and people in our community to be able to properly charge their vehicles. And as you noted, it's going to take four times the number of gasoline stations that we see today. And as a result, it, you know, piqued um, the concern of the congressman you just mentioned, uh, Congressman uh, Cardenas, and uh, it prompted a, a caucus recently that you were a part of in Washington, D.C. Please talk a little bit about that and talk about the top concerns that the Hispanic caucus expressed and why we should all be paying attention. Well, we should all be paying attention because uh, last week I had the opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. as a moderator for the Congressional Hispanic Institute Caucus. Uh, Latino Summit, which basically involved bringing people together all across the country as sort of a think tank to discuss some of the issues and the technologies that are going to be around the next 15 years and how do we get to participate. Because in Washington, where the money goes, uh, like I say, a lobbyist move, um, companies get compensated with your tax dollars. 
For example, Ford announced and GM announced that deadline even earlier to stop making cars in 2030, which means in seven years, they'll start make they'll stop making gasoline cars. Okay. In and seven how- years, <laughs> they're going to stop making gasoline cars. And nobody, nobody's aware of that. We're just aware that in 35, gasoline stops. But these companies are being, once again, subsidized by your tax dollars to make up the difference to get behind the eight ball. And so that's a big challenge because what about the average consumer who has to buy the EV? Well, before, uh, you used to get a subsidy of 7500 or even more or twice as much if you bought an EV in California and the United States. Well, that is gone. So in other words, you're, you're paying up front all the costs, whereas companies like this are paying are paying or getting subsidized by your tax dollars. And the reason for this congressional summit was to bring the best of the minds and the best people to begin the discussion, which nobody is talking about. We all talk about the marketing and how far it's going to go and the batteries and things. But as a mass market, and right now we are at that mass where we're just consuming. And so we're going to be the hardest to be hit. So not only as a consumer, but also there is no pipeline from, uh, from these companies to allow younger individuals who are talented to move into an industry, whether it's ownership or part of a corporation as engineer or architects. STEM, you know, is one of those people. You know, right. If you, people don't know who STEM is, well, it's allowing students at this point and people who want to get into technologies, the technologies, the high sciences, artificial intelligence, those things, um, an avenue. And so we want to make sure that the Latinos are represented because so there's something about a car that uh, represents, you know, a culture. And if you go across the world, you go to Mexico and you see the cars, there's sort of a hip, fun thing to it. You go to the Philippines, the buses are decorated different. You go to Europe and they're tiny little cars. So, and then the United States, we're sort of like, you know, we got to the bland stage where almost all the cars look the same and have the same three colors. But, you know, with this new technology, there's a window that's open that allows us to begin this discussion. And I think uh, Congressman uh, Cardenas is voicing his opinion, bringing these things in the forefront that Latinos are being left out of the conversation and other Congress people who are part of this uh, of this infrastructure in order voting on it and present it to their colleagues are beginning to understand that we don't just want to be a consumer and pay top dollar and not get subsidized. And the difference, you know, companies get subsidized, we have to take out a loan for the car with interest. Big difference. And it's usually it's two or three to, uh, three two or three times the cost of a car because yeah, very big loan. difference. Very different. So <laughs> yes. it, so we want that subsidy back. If you're going to force people to get into this technology, then they should have a break because it's their own money. And so uh, the issues are being raised, as I say, as batteries and technology. We all know that, uh, and I'll give you a hint, that uh, batteries in most new EV cars will last seven years. That's it, because you're constantly recharging them and they drain out. Just like recycled batteries, we know, you know, you use them and get and there comes a point where they don't recharge. Well, the cost to replace those batteries in seven years, in a hidden cost, 15 to 20,000. Wow. Okay. Are you ready for that 15 to 20,000 to maintain climate uh, change? Uh, and it's all coming out of your pocket without a subsidy. So, you know, things have to be talked about. And this is where I go back to research and development. It's ideal that we're moving in a great direction, you know, to, to heal our planet, to save our planet for future generations. But at the same time, we also got to understand that these are going to cost things, situations that we haven't thought of yet. And that's why companies before, you know, would spend a lot of time in R&D and it took products, you know, five to six years to get out. And now the average product gets out in less than one year. And once again, you're the person, like say, uh, enjoying the, the process of paying top dollar for it. Right. And, and you're excited about it. But, you know, other companies are at other, like I say, uh, petroleum companies that are converting are getting subsidized. Right. OK, so prior to the break, we touched on infrastructure and what that infrastructure uh, sustainability model should look like. Right. Let's look at the infrastructure we have today and what amount of growth or, you know, evolution we need to um, complete in order to keep up with the demand? Well, to keep up with the demand, we actually have to generate a new electrical system. And that's going to take time. 
So the caveat or say the problem or the issue we have now is who gets the power? And because of, we'll see blackouts for the reason that the system can't sustain itself. It naturally has to power down to cool itself off. And if it doesn't cool itself off, then we have these tremendous tragedies, as we've seen in California, where power lines fall down and have burned major fires, towns, and even people have died because of technology overuse on an electrical system on a windy day. And it's just a basic windy day. And, uh, and so that is one challenge. And then it becomes to the point, well, if I have a smartphone and every, a smart home and everything is intelligent and connected and, you know, people over here in, in urbanized neighborhoods only have Wi-Fi, should they sacrifice their power to make sure that these people who have the smart home, the standard of living that is projected for the future? So it pits, it's going to pit some people together and, it, and some cities are going to find, you know, why is this happening to me? Uh, and the food chain. So yes, at this point, the electrical system cannot sustain what we currently have. And that's why the congressman is calling for, let's extend that deadline just a little bit more, because we know by 2040, 2050, we're at the minimum, you know, we can handle it, it gives us an opportunity to do that. But you know, as, as people rush for the subsidies, um, this is, this is what, you know, things and possible scenarios that the we haven't thought about from the electrical and that doesn't include our real life daily issues. And we'll talk about those too. Right. And so during uh, this convergence, during this caucus in DC, were there any discussions about how to prepare the infrastructure or how long it would take to actually, um, you know, get it up to speed and create uh, sustainability so that everyone could, you know, charge their electric vehicles or their smart homes and all of the above, you know, all of our electronics that we have today. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, just on a hot day when we're running our ACs, that overstresses our electrical grids and causes rolling blackouts. That's something we're very used to. So, you know, tie in how many millions of electric vehicles onto that grid and, and what can we expect, right? The number, yeah. <laughs> the so, number, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you this, uh, just so you get it, we get into the electrical stuff, is that we spent billions of dollars uh, right now just to harden our electrical systems from being hacked, okay? Mm. And, and trying to upgrade uh, some of the smaller electrical companies across the United States that just don't have the parts anymore. That just The reality is that that, that system or generation of electricity uh, to generate is no longer uh, you know, fixable. So we know we spent those hardening from, that's what they call so that nobody hacks our system. Okay. So we've done something right in that avenue. But we haven't begun the process of actually, you know, uh, replacing everything, every line in in the neighborhood, because most of these lines are 60 to 70 years old and they haven't been replaced. And anybody who knows uh, about electricity, it gets hot. Even if your cell phone, you have it in your pocket. What happens? You know, you feel, hey, my cell phone is getting hot right. because that's energy being expanded by electricity. So imagine that 100 times more on a wire. Well, what the wire does is snap. And then uh, depending on what locality you are, we're locked. We're talking four to six weeks. And if we're looking to get the whole system up or minimum up, we're looking 2060, almost 2070. So that's what we're 2020. We're almost 50 years away from what we want to be in 10 years. So wow. that's what so, I said. So we're trying to squeeze 50 years of infrastructure into technically – eight years uh, according to these policies but we're not going to be prepared we're still going to need 40 more years to build out the infrastructure so what happens during those 40 years well this is where things begin to disappear you know and right. these are challenges that uh, in the fashion industry alone is probably one of the greatest greenhouse gas makers and in, in, that people don't realize 10 percent of our greenhouse gases come from fashion okay all those little what do you call those sweatpants girls are wearing nowadays you know that uh, leggings leggings, the leggings? Uh, okay. uh, forgive me ladies they're called leggings um <laughs> they're called leggings. they look beautiful but uh because they're synthetic um that will disappear um and in the industry particularly the clothing industry a lot of synthetics in the fashion industry, a lot of oil and petroleum is used in in circumstances that you don't realize they got rid of the vegetable oil and makeup because it made the makeup rot and, you know, got people sick. Well, they added petroleum because it's better shelf life. It makes for good for perfumes and mascara, eyeliner, lipstick. So 
if you're going to be having situations where these things disappear for quite some time, um, that's a change in lifestyle. I mean, that uh, you're not expecting, you know, that the makeup, that mascara, the lipstick that you normally use is, yeah, it's hard to find. You can't right. find it. So, so to clarify, right, the, the energy um, impact is not going to be solely on transportation, but on every facet that petroleum is used in, right? Fossil fuels. And like you said, it's in, it's in textiles. It's in so many, th- it's in packaging, right? And so plastic. many things <laughs> that we use every day. Yes, plastic. And we use plastic every day, all day for various purposes. Um, please talk a little bit about the real impact that's going to have. Because when people think about, you know, this um, energy issue, they're thinking more along the lines of transportation and, you know, uh, sustainability and reducing greenhouse gases. But they're looking only at a, at a portion of the segment of how it is that we're going to be impacted without considering, you know, this whole yeah. other tremendous marketplace of things that we've become accustomed to, right? I love my leggings. I don't know about you. I love oh, my it. leggings. <laughs> I'm wearing my mascara, right? And, um, you know, the thought of, I mean, it sounds daunting and overwhelming to come up with solutions to create, you know, substitutes or better solutions to the petroleum. Yeah, um, there's not, there's you know, not enough avenue. sheep and everybody's against fur. So, you know, how do, how do we live in a world with, you know, we're trying to get wool and cotton and then there's no fur because people are anti-fur. So there's a lot of things in this process that people are not realizing. Also, in our state of California, we outlawed the use of, of wood, uh, that you can't burn wood anymore, charcoal or those things outside. So these are the things that, as you say, in particular, Latino community that loves to have a carne asada barbecue outside yes. um, and or have a ring pit and just enjoy the moment. Um, that's going away. So, uh, you know, those very simple things that make life bearable in the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Sometimes you just want to sit by the campfire, chill, put a marshmallow, you know, and, and, and get a, and get a s'mores. Well, that's gone, you know, so because. So, so that's news to me. I'm <laughs> sorry, but really fire pits are going to be. Yes. Outlawed? Chimneys, ch- chimneys are outlawed in California by the tw- You can't burn your uh, wood in your chimney or outside of the house or in a camping ground. Uh, propane will also be banned because it's, or will be hard to get because it's part of, uh, part of petroleum. So you can't take a propane tank to go camping and light up the gas stove and cook your breakfast. So how do you cook? What do you do? How do you camp <laughs> without fire? And these are things that as it, as it trickles down that we didn't think of, but they are going to be affected. It doesn't mean that it's all going to go away, but systematically it's phasing uh, because of the, the the greenhouse gases and a uh, gun ho advocates, and I love their passion, but at the same time, let's let's be reasonable to do these things. And I think uh, this is one of the issues that that uh, I was talking to the congressman is that why do we have offsetting credits here? Well, we can go, uh, uh, to to uh, get rid of greenhouse gases. That means that I can't, uh, my company can't do any of this. You know, uh, to help the environment. So I'm going to pay to I'm going to pay somebody to plant trees or something of that sort. I say, why not subsidize uh, Ecuador, or, uh, Australia or Thailand and India, because those are the most polluting countries. They put out two or three times more pollution in greenhouse gases than we do. Instead of saying, let's plant 100 trees. Well, that's great. But that's zero, zero point one percent that affects greenhouse gases when we can say, let's Let's look at these countries that are putting twice as much. And if we can't do it, offset it in those countries. So people aren't thinking about those things is how we can, like, say, think out of the box. Right. And, and because we can go all greenhouse in emission and be happy and free in nirvana. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have polluting countries outside of us, you know, besides the majors um, that uh, really could use the technology and also save, uh, save their environments. Because as, as we look at just the battery issue, Lithium uh, is required for batteries. The right. major area for lithium, the major deposit is Bolivia, Ecuador, and Argentina. Hmm. So we would have to strip mine those countries to get all the batteries we need just to have our EV cars. 
And this is something that would be projected to have to be done every seven years, right? Because yes. the life of the battery. I mean, I don't think those countries are going to be very happy with us in our in our public policy of what we're you know mandating here. Um, and and one area that we haven't even discussed that when we talked about it, just wow, you know, the light bulb went on. It's and that's agriculture. How is this going to affect our agricultural community? Well, you know, the trucking industry is suffering right now because they're forced to give up their diesel trucks and a lot of them are just quitting the business. That's why they said there's no more drivers or we're having truck issue challenges because mm. it's the standards that they created, which are right. absolutely ridiculous. And then the time frame, you know, where you used to go two days and a half to cross the country in a diesel. Well, you know, now it takes five days. And then in an electric diesel, in an electric motor and cold, well, it says 300 miles. But in cold, in cold weather, you cut your, your mileage in half. Oh, my goodness. And then you cut your mileage by the, by the haul that you have. So depending now, you have to, uh, you have to take uh, how much weight, you have to consider how much weight, you know, and wh what weather you're hauling in. And that now was, you know, two-day trip or one-day trip. It becomes in the snow or rain or any of that sort because batteries and electricity are affected highly by weather. Right. Um, that these trips take longer so that, you know, now what used to be a 99th, you know, sense thing product that you bought, you know, you're incrementing to a dollar ninety, two ninety nine, five ninety nine, because once again, the price that we're paying is gets has to be passed on and reflected right. in, in those in charges like that. But even the agriculture industry is going to suffer because they don't have EV tractors. They, they, no, they have got all the EV combines. Right. Nothing has been done from that whole industry that relies on diesel. You know, and so. Yeah, and that's challenging. So like I say, as we rush, not just to get rid of cars, major industries, our lifestyles will change and impact it. And uh, like I say, we're, we're right now are only, are, if, we, if we did everything we wanted to do in this world and in in freeing ourselves from these greenhouse gases, we're only at 1% to the world. Right, right. And I made a joke off air, but uh, I'm kind of serious about this because the way mm -hmm. this... Uh, to these mandates are being implemented, it seems like they're just being implemented without thought of what the implications are really going to mean without the proper infrastructure. And my joke was, is the government going to give us a time machine to go back to the future, you know, uh, 40 years from now to build out that infrastructure and then come back and have it ready for us to actually meet these mandates, right? Oops. Because... If, if we have these mandates that are due in 2030, but the infrastructure is going to take an additional 30 or 40 years to build out to actually sustain it, what is going to be, um, what can we look forward to? What is our quality of life going to look like during the, that time that we don't have the infrastructure? Well, at this point, I guess the word is sacrifice. And the, and the, and the slogan will be, you're saving energy and you're, you know, you're saving the planet. But that's not saving me. I mean, and that's the, and that's one of the things that we have to understand because as they repeat the slogan, you know, the the more you do to 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 better the planet, you're saving energy. Yes, we're saving energy, but somebody's profiting from that energy, and the profit does not come to the 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 person at the bottom of the food chain. He has to suffer. He has to mitigate. You know, how do I in the circumstances that you give me? I can't burn wood. Okay. And this is going to take me twice the amount to get to work, you know. And so you start thinking these things. Well, you know, that my quality of life just changed. And now people are realistically, as they look at gasoline right now, you know, it used to be carefree. Okay, come on over. And you may be in Diamond Bar and that's 40 miles away. It was nothing. Now people plan. Well, let's do it on the weekend and because I have to do three things in that area. Right. Well, nobody thought of that before. Or even just driving down the coast. You know, let's go take a drive down the coast and just put our hair to the wind in a convertible. And you know, you 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 saw the Lexus. It was a Lexus convertible that you had yes, an opportunity to be in. Yes, it was beautiful. Yes. And so yeah, that's that was what not did. an electric vehicle. That was a V eight. So I'm glad I didn't pick it up because in seven years I would have to do something with it. <laughs> well, that's it. And that and that becomes uh, how do we recycle all this stuff? Because right. like, so as gas stations come out of, out of use, as cars become you know out of use. How do we recycle it? So it creates another problem uh, that another, I wouldn't say problem, but another issue that wasn't thought about. So I think, you know, the future is promising because we have knowledge and technology to guide us, but man's reasoning sometimes and the pressure to, like I say, to do good. And in that process, um, 
I guess the, the, the phrase is a do-gooder, you know, sometimes it's too good to be true, you know? Right. And so it actually makes it worse than what it is. But where there's, where there's money and particularly this, this political cycle has brought billions of dollars of subsidies, nobody's going to pass it up. Um, like I say, and like the same opportunity, then also per the summit and per uh, we saw at the car show, then let Latinos be owners, like I say, and to be part of this system where they they generate wealth for them and their families and a lifestyle that's commensurate with 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 the with their values. And so, if we can do that, then we've done our job. Otherwise, it, it's just mass consumption. And at the end of mass consumption. Um, what do we do with all this junk? You know, it's like your house filled with so much stuff and you're like, well, what do I do with it? Well, right, that becomes right. another issue in that sense. But that's why I say I'm very proud of what the Congress people are doing uh, in okay, the Latino Congress people are doing in Congress now is let's begin this conversation. We may not get everything, but at least the process of, like say, mitigating some of these circumstances, working with other countries that bring the greenhouse gas gases down. So now it's just not the United States. You know, shooting themselves in the foot so that we can look good, and because of because of these people providing those materials to us to make this lifestyle happen. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Jose. And for anybody that's listening and wants to learn more about these policies, these mandates, and what we can expect to see coming down the pipeline, go to chic.org. Thank you so much for being with us today, Jose. Well, thank you very much. And don't forget, you can also email your congressman and just uh, it, it's dot congress or dot senate.org. And then that's it. Beautiful. All right. So for everybody listening, don't forget to look for us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on scbrtalk.com. And don't forget to download the free live streaming app on Google Play or the Apple App Store. Don't miss my interview with Eric Bracone, president and CEO of Bracone Construction Incorporated. Eric was born in Whittier, California, May 5th, 1981. He grew up in LA County in the city of La Mirada and graduated a matador from La Mirada High School in 1999. Immediately after graduation, he enrolled at Fullerton College. Eric married his high school sweetheart and now have five boys together. Eric started in construction by installing solid wood doors and windows in custom homes throughout Orange County. He was then quickly recruited by a friend to work overnight installing wood fixtures in grocery stores, starting off sweeping a broom as a laborer with perseverance and over time, he quickly moved into a fixture installer, then lead carpenter roles. He eventually managed hundreds of grocery store and pharmacy remodels in his 13 years with a large San Diego based general contractor. In 2013, he applied and accepted a position with the Fortune 10 company as a construction manager. Eric pioneered a new way of virtual walkthroughs of building using technology which is now standard at this Fortune company. Eric has always been a faith-driven and family-oriented person after three and a half years working and traveling throughout the U.S., and next week, we will have Dr. Eileen Dinkjian and Dr. Andres Gonzalez. Dr. Dinkjian serves as the Executive Director of Population Health at the San Antonio Regional Hospital, Randall Lewis Healthy Communities Institute. Eileen leads the development of population health management initiatives and provides leadership and oversight for the HCI and community outreach programs. Dr. Gonzalez attended Weber State University from August 2004 to May 2008 and earned both a Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Arts degrees. From January 2009 to June 2014, Dr. Gonzalez was a student at Universidad Autonoma de Guadalajara School of Medicine, where he received a Doctor of Medicine. He participated in a pre-internship program at St. Joseph's Medical Center through New York Medical City College from July 2013 to June 2014 in conjunction with his doctorate program. We will see you all next week. Do not miss it. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.